we have an amazing person on the show today, Yen Perkis. And I saw Yen speak oh, about a fortnight ago at an event, and I was mesmerized by her story, by her humor, and what she had to offer. Hi, this is Zoe Rath, and this is the Zoe Rath Leadership Podcast. So, Yen is a passionate advocate for autism and autistic people. She works in the public service. She has published six books, six books, and is quite remarkable. She has an extended blog and hosts a radio show as well. So welcome, Yen. Oh, thank you. And I might just point out it's perfectly good, but I'm actually a non-binary person and I use they and them pronouns. So oh, perfect. I identify as she, but that's perfectly fine. Thank you so much for pointing that out because that slips out subconsciously or non-consciously, I should say. And I did see that. I was going to ask you about that actually as non-binary gender and what you prefer to use. So would you mind starting with that actually? Like what does that mean to be identified as non-binary gender? So I spent most of my life being expected to be a girl and I never quite fitted in with the girl thing. And um, I remember when I was about eight, I used to live in England. And of course, in England, once it gets above about 20 degrees Celsius, everyone whips off their shirts or all the boys do. And the boys were whipping off their shirts and showing their bare chests. And I thought, well, I haven't got any boobies. I'm eight. I'm going to whip my shirt off too. And I got in no end of trouble at school for doing such a dreadful thing. And I honestly couldn't think why there was an issue with that. Um, And that was quite similar for me in terms of gendered experience. I didn't know what to do with dolls. I couldn't see the point. They were like little plastic people and what was the interest? And I just couldn't figure out what the point was. And as I grew older, my expression was quite clearly more masculine than feminine in terms of how people expect gender to present. And I used to wonder why that was. And I used to wish there was a third option for gender because I didn't feel that I fitted with the boy gender or the girl gender. And of course, that was in the 80s and 90s. And we didn't know about gender identity like we do today. And in recent years, I've got a lot of autistic friends who are also transgender. And I got talking with these friends and talking about how I felt about my idea of gender. And I sort of worked out, nobody put the idea in my mind, but during those conversations, I started thinking, well, maybe I'm more similar to a trans person than I am to a cisgendered person. And I started looking into it and I came across this idea of non-binary gender and I thought that fits me absolutely perfectly. And it is an umbrella term. So it's a bit like saying the autism spectrum and there's lots of things within that. Well, it's the same within non-binary. There's all sorts of different identities like gender fluid and things like demi boy and demi girl and stuff like that and other sort of subordinate identities I suppose that are equally important but we sit beneath that umbrella but for me that's who I am and it was an utter liberation coming out as non-binary and it had the weirdest impacts on things I wouldn't have thought it would so one of them is status anxiety I'm a very ambitious person I'm very driven And I really used to struggle with the idea that I wasn't as good as everyone else and that everyone else had more capability, you know, more intellect, more skill, more talent than me. And almost as soon as I came out as non-binary, that ceased to be an issue. And I didn't care about that because I was myself. I got to be who I am. And so there was no need for that status anxiety because I wasn't insecure about who I was. I actually knew who I was. And it's been a wonderful journey. It's been great because I'm quite known in the autism community and that means other people who are autistic and gender diverse have worked out through reading my writing on the topic that maybe that's them as well and that's lovely and the best thing a few months ago I stayed with a friend in Melbourne and she's got two kids and one of them identifies as non-binary and I came down for breakfast because I stayed overnight came down for breakfast and my friend was telling their child who's non-binary oh Yen uses they them pronouns as well and this kid's face just lit up they were so happy it was just the best thing ever that this cool adult was non-binary too so that kind of thing that the leadership qualities of having an identity are quite amazing and, and really beautiful I love that it has been such an empowering journey for you. And it's probably one of the first times I've heard anybody say that their status anxiety dropped as they defined their identity. It's often the reverse. It's once you attach to an identity, you load it up with significance. 
and expectation. So I find it fascinating that that actually dropped for you. I love how you say leadership, politics, and identity. So I want to come back to what you said that you're a highly ambitious person. Could you explain that a little bit more in terms of how does ambition and leadership politics sit with you? How do you see that playing out in your world? In my 20s, in my early 20s, I did every terrible thing that you could do. I ruined my life. I put myself in a position where I probably should have been dead on several occasions and I was really very defeated and defeating. And I had no hope for my life. This was as a result of a lot of abuse and bullying when I was younger, I think, and so I had no self-esteem. I didn't want positive things in my life. I wanted actual negative things, and so I sought them out. And, of course, it's very easy to get negative things if you want them. And so I, I really didn't have much of a life to attach myself to. And so when I was 25, I decided to change that. I wanted a better life. I wanted, in my own words, I wanted to be ordinary. I wanted... Um, nine to five job I wanted an education I wanted a suit and I wanted a mortgage that was what I thought I, was <laughs> and I didn't have any chance at that point in my life of achieving any of those goals oh, I could have got a suit from the op shop I guess but it didn't you know these are the other things to go along with it and so I set about changing my life and I had the only thing I really had going for me was my own sense of motivation and determination which is quite formidable and my family, I had a really supportive family who stuck by me even when most people's families would have given up on them. And so those two things were what I had, ambition, drive, motivation and a good family. I took things incrementally. I decided to go to university. I thought that was the first step and then I could get a graduate job presumably when I was finished. And so I went to university and I was, I'd been in university before and had dropped out and wasn't really engaged with it. But when I went back, I had purpose, I had motivation, I wanted to do well. And I suddenly got all these high distinctions and was really very uh, high achiever at university, which I hadn't expected. And I ended up doing an honours degree and a master's degree. Work was really important. So work was my driving force. I hadn't worked. When I was 25, I hadn't worked in many years. I think the last job I'd had was when I was 19. So I had very little work history. I had dodgy criminal record stuff from that time in my life. I had very little understanding of how work was. And when I was in first year uni and I started getting high marks and things, I thought, well, maybe I could get a job. So I got myself a dishwashing job in a rest stop two nights a week. I was so anxious about that job. It caused so much anxiety and perfectionism that I got really unwell with mental health stuff and had to quit the job and almost had to quit university. And so at that point in my life, I didn't think I will never be able to work. I thought, I can't work now, but I will be in the future. So I was driven by that real ambition, that, that pulling me forward, those goals and motivations. And I was pushed in the direction of wanting to change. So I had the pull of the ambition and the push of the wanting to change. And I managed to achieve some incredible things. So in 2005, I wrote my first book, uh, which was published. It was an autobiography. And that gave me confidence to apply for public service roles, which I knew I wasn't going to get. I was fairly certain I would be unsuccessful in applying for a role in the public service, given my mental health issues, my autism, my criminal history, my lack of work history or my very small work history. But I knew I could do the job. And I figured if I didn't apply and I would have got the job, I would have lost a lot. If I did apply and I didn't get it, I'd be in exactly the same situation I was. And that was not so bad. So that's what I did. And I actually was successful. And thankfully, that lovely book I wrote was a really good catalyst in convincing my department at the time that I wasn't at risk because the things written from a great perspective and very positive and wanting to change. And so that satisfied a lot of my ambitions. But I kept going. And in 2012, my autism advocacy became really important because I met a young man who was on the spectrum who was really disabled, not by autism, but by everyone's low expectations of what he could do. And I saw this young man and I thought, if there's one of these people, there's got to be a lot more and this is terrible. If people are getting a diagnosis, it should lead to good stuff, not bad stuff. And so that level of ambition just ticked up a bit more. And I started writing many more books, presentations, and I became, shortly after that, I was asked to give a talk for TEDx. I gave a talk for TEDx. And then mm -hmm. as life went on, I got more and more and more accomplished. My Autism World CV, so my presentations, books, writing, media appearances, awards, all that kind of thing, is 26 pages. 
Um, I have <laughs> That's amazing. in the last 20 years more than most people would achieve in a lifetime and coming from a really difficult starting point. So that for me, that level of ambition has been a really positive thing in the most part and has driven my leadership. And I also, I would never say to someone, I overcame all these difficulties, why haven't you? That's not something I'd ever say or think. But I do the positive version of that, which is to be a role model and set an example that other people that might be having difficulties can live by and can actually use. And that's that's a lovely thing to do. If you, if you overcome dreadful things in your own life, that's great. But if you can use it to help other people do the same, that's even better. So much amazing stuff in your story. Going back to the dishwasher job that gave you so much anxiety and you wrote a book and then you applied for the public service. Just curious about, first of all, about the dishwashing job. What was it about that job that made you so anxious? It was the idea of doing a bad job and I worried that it would make the restaurant go out of business and it would be my fault. My dad had a small business for a long time and I was always aware of the needs of small business for people and I just got really overblown on the worry about what if I make a mistake. I mean, because the worst thing that would have happened if I'd made a mistake would have been maybe I dropped a plate or sent back a dirty fork or something like that. But those things in my mind just got blown out of all proportion and it's quite a common thing for autistic people to do is that catastrophizing so taking one situation and blowing it up into something way more stressful and difficult than it's ever going to be and that's exactly what I did and I remember I really forced myself to go to that job and I'd be highly anxious from the morning I woke up and the job started in the evening and I'd just be in this heightened state of anxiety all day and it did now if I was doing something like that I think right this isn't working out I'm going to stop but then I didn't I didn't have that level of self-awareness I think I'm very fortunate to have the level of self-awareness I do now. So you obviously started to become aware that this was a pattern and this is something that you dealt with incrementally over the years as you got new experiences and new confidence in what you were doing? Definitely. And with work, the thing I know now, I mean, I've been in the public service for over 12 years now and I know I'm good at my job. I I work hard, I'm diligent, I keep across everything. I know that my managers are pretty happy to have me. Um, But I didn't used to know that. That level of confidence comes from experience. Um, When I first joined the public service, I always used to worry. I mean, my first week I got asked to do an Excel spreadsheet and I'd never really done an Excel spreadsheet before. You don't do much of that when you're doing a visual arts degree. And um, so I thought, oh, how hard is it? I'll just wing it. Well, you can't really just wing it with Excel. So terrified, I went back to my supervisor and said, oh, I'm so sorry, I haven't really used Excel. And I thought he'd say, right, you're going back to Melbourne. We don't want you. But instead he said, oh, well, why don't you go and do an Excel course at the computer training place? I'm like, ah, okay, I can do that. So that level of confidence that, you know, it's actually okay at work and that, you know, nobody else is holding themselves to account as much as I am, you know, that nobody is as diligent and and ridiculous with their work ethic as me. I've never met anyone like that. So now it's tempered a bit with a bit of wisdom and I don't worry so much. (laughs) And I love that. Yeah, those kinds of things only come through experience and reflection, I think. So growing up, So you knew that you were different because you were getting bullied for being different. Did you know what your difference was about at that time? No, no. I I was diagnosed with Asperger's in 1994, which is the first year that that diagnosis was available in Australia. So I was 20 at the time. When I was at school, there was no concept of Asperger's or autism or anything like that. It, It wasn't it wasn't like it is now. And I always say to young people. I went to school as an undiagnosed person in a world with no diagnosis. So the difference between then and now is that an undiagnosed autistic kid is probably going to be noticed at school by teachers or school counsellors or something like that. They're almost certainly someone will know that they're on the spectrum. There is a lexicon for that. Whereas when I was a kid, there wasn't. I was just a weird kid who was a communist and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I had these passionate interests that are all a bit dark and negative. And um, I never knew. I felt very isolated. I didn't think there was anyone else in the world like me. I thought I was the only one. I was actually the highest achiever academically in my year. I came top of the year every year I was stuck in the school. So academically, I was really brilliant. 
but I was miserable and I hated school and it never occurred to me not to go. I think kids now always go, nah, not going, but that wasn't an option when I, well, it wasn't presented to me as an option. Um, and I felt I had to go because that's what you did. That was the rules. Um, and so I did. But if I'd known I could get out of it and not go, I definitely would have chosen that because it was quite horrible, very damaging. That would, that would have, I mean, it's no wonder that you ended up in the dark land of experimentation and uh, to try and numb some of that, that pain of difference and not knowing of why it is that you were different to others and not having anything that could put some boundaries and shape on that. And then to also have the gender piece be ambiguous for you as well. These layers of difference, I can imagine were quite turbulent. And, but then you seem to have come through it and have that level of clarity be so empowering. What's your perspective on diversity, having come through all that? Yeah, diversity is a really, and, and related to diversity, inclusion is also a really important concept. Diversity is the noun and inclusion is the verb. That's how I see it. So diversity is what you have. The world is diverse. Workplaces are diverse. Schools are diverse. That's just a fact. Whereas inclusion, you can either have that or you can not have that. And I think diversity, it's really important to have those, as you mentioned, those intersectional lenses, that understanding that different diversity elements compound one another. So it's not like it adds, it multiplies. And so the issues that somebody who's autistic and transgender experience are very different to those of someone who's just autistic experience and all of the, all of the diversities. And then you get the idea of privilege and that doesn't mean people are necessarily bad. It just means they don't have those levels of, of diversity. And I have some privileges. I definitely have middle-class privilege and I definitely have white privilege. And it's not, it's not a matter of feeling bad about that. It's a matter of being aware of it and making sure that when you're dealing with people, you, you are cognizant that you do have that privilege and their experience is going to be very different to yours and just being respectful. I think I was born inclusive. I've never been knowingly bigoted against anyone ever. I'm not judgmental, all of those things. And so I find judgment and bigotry very difficult to understand. I don't see, I don't see the rationale behind it. We're all people. Um, but I think that's quite rare. I think most people have some level of, of prejudice or, or judgment about them, and that's just about being human. But it is a matter of being aware of that. It's like when people accidentally misgender me, like you did. Mm. I'm not going to yell at them. I'll just point it out, and that's okay. And I, I'm not expecting people to instantly use my correct pronouns. And a lot of people get my pronouns wrong and apologise. I'm like, well, that's actually okay. The fact that you apologise means you're thinking about it. It's when people just assume is it, that's more of a problem. Um, but it is about you know checking the privilege and being aware and respectful. Treat other people like you want to be treated. If you want to ask someone a question, think of someone asking it to you. And if it's probing and rude, then don't ask it of someone else. You know, um, you find that a lot with trans people. They get asked all sorts of gruesome things. And you just think, if you wouldn't ask it to your mother, don't ask it to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think respect goes a long way. I think respect is really important and being aware that we're all different and that that's okay and, and seeing the learning about other people's experience. You know, I'm always fascinated to learn about different cultural experiences, you know, different people's stories. I read a lot of autobiographical stuff, a lot of blogs by people from all walks of life and I find that really helpful. I agree. In fact, it's one of the things I advocate is that you can learn and expand your perspective by learning other people's stories, either through reading or documentaries and so on. Uh, I'm wondering for you, though, does it get exhausting to have to continually explain yourself for your differences? Yeah, it does, actually. And the idea that people need me to educate them, and I just think, well, I don't expect anyone else to educate me about diversity by using their own story and it does get a bit tiring and you just, you want to help people out and bring them along on their journey. But sometimes you just think, can I just like be me and like have a night off? The other thing I get is requests for advice. Every day someone will ask me, hey, could you tell me about this? And sometimes it's really easy stuff about publishing books and stuff, but sometimes it's really dark stuff about like, um, domestic violence or homelessness or something like that and I'm always happy to answer I'm happy to give my advice 
but it does I do sometimes think oh could you ask someone else because I'm tired and emotionally it can be very tiring having people wanting my thoughts left right and center I mean I, I do respond to everyone's questions usually uh, as long as they're respectful and not I had someone ask me something that was a bit creepy and I just thought oh, I'm not engaging in that I'm just going to let that go but generally I'll respond but it is nice to have a bit of a night off sometimes. Absolutely and I think that's part of the challenge of being a public figure and you've presented yourself as a very public figure as an advocate as a leader hosting a rodeo show rodeo <laughs> radio show maybe it is a bit of a rodeo. Yeah. <laughs> And the responsibility that comes from being a pioneer, because I think that is part of what you're doing, is being a pioneering, visible role model for people with either autism or with gender differences, and that can become quite burdensome. And I was thinking about this too, you know, like how do people learn about difference if they don't have it in their immediate reality? I mean, we talked about reading books and learning vicariously. And sometimes you don't know what you don't know until it smacks you in the face. Do you have any suggestions for that? Like how can we continue yeah. to educate ourselves about difference? I've got a wonderful story that relates to that. I have a friend who's a woman and she's from a Polish refugee background and she used to work um, in a government department and her boss was organising a conference and she was helping out. So the boss was a cisgendered, white, heterosexual, able-bodied man, lots of privilege going on, and he got a speaker list for this conference and gave it to my friend. And my friend looked at him and she goes, you don't have any women speakers, you don't have any people of colour. And the boss said, oh, what amazing insight. How did you know that? So I think often it's a matter of just being aware of privilege and just being aware that we don't know stuff and we need to learn. And that manager was quite fine. He wasn't being deliberately discriminatory. It just honestly didn't occur to him because he'd never known. So I think actively seeking out information and people working out where there are points of difference and what they can learn is really important and being aware that their experience isn't the only experience. And I think that's one of the things you get with privilege is that people assume that their experience is the only experience. And then when people come along from a disadvantaged background or from a diverse background, they get judged as not being able to meet up to the standards of these privileged people. Well, of course they can't. They're about five steps behind in, in the journey of life and always struggling to catch up. That's how it works. I do find that for me, I feel I have to be exemplary. I feel that I have to be absolutely spot on in everything I do or you know, I will be judged and I'm always aware of that. And I think most people who've achieved a lot and have come from diverse backgrounds have a similar feeling about life. And it's not a conscious feeling. It's just the basis of where I'm coming from is, oh, I have to be, I have to be better than everyone just to prove myself. That's a perfectionist tendency rearing its head again. Oh, absolutely. I, I use it though. I used to be destroyed by perfectionism and now I, I have it pretty well harnessed and I actually, it means I don't make mistakes, but I don't get worried about making mistakes. And I've actually got to a point where if I do something, if I do get something wrong, I'm quite good at apologising and not doing it again. And I've learned that that's what you do. If you do make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. Learn from it. Don't do it again. Apologise. Make amends. You know, if it's a mistake with consequences, just try and address the consequences. I mean, with my work as an advocate, if I was too much of a perfectionist, I wouldn't cope at all because people would ask me for advice and I wouldn't be able to say anything in case I gave them the wrong advice. Um, and I've, I've learned over the years with that stuff and I do very well with that now, but it's been a journey. I love how you use privilege as the anchoring point uh, because I've, when I'm thinking about difference, I think what is the difference from the norm? And I think norm is loaded, is loaded with judgment. And then except in using privilege, that's got a bit more fluidity to it. It's like what creates privilege. It's not about what's normal in quotation marks. It's about what is it about ourselves that gives us privilege, which often gives us blinkers. So I like the fact that you use privilege as the kind of anchoring point, you know, be mindful of your privileged position as opposed to your normative position. How did you come to see difference versus privilege the, and the connection between them? I find the whole idea of a norm and deviations from a norm actually inaccurate because there mm. is no norm. Mm. Is that an average person? What do we average? Yeah. And so I've never really seen it like that. And I find when you're talking about autism and people 
Um, sometimes people use functioning labels for autism, which I find really unhelpful. So they say high function or low function. And those are, are shorthands for, for clinical experience, but they're not actually very useful because they're basically talking about deviations from a norm. But what is the norm? Is there is there a line? I don't think there is a line that's just the autism spectrum with the most autistic person at one end and the most neurotypical person at the other. It doesn't work like that. So actually, it's not about deviations from a norm. It's about, yeah, it's practical. You know, how is your experience in life? If you're from a diversity group, how do you address the fact that you're not privileged? How, how do you overcome these hurdles? It's not... It's not about there's all these normal people and we're not like them. But I think a lot of people think like that still. I, I don't find it. I've never found it a very helpful way of approaching uh, diversity. I think it's such a, a useful distinction. And I think that's a huge gift. So thank you for that. Oh, all good. Yep. <laughs> I'm curious. Have you ever had your perspective turned around, spun on its heel about maybe a perspective about yourself, which we've spoken to a little bit before when you uh, determined that you were non-binary gender. Is there another another time where you've had a perspective turned around that you, you've held dearly and then it changed? Not so much, not quickly. Um, over time, I've, my thinking has changed a lot, but it's more like a glacial shift, I think. <laughs> the problem with being me is that I'm really, it's not really a problem, but I'm very well respected in the community and very few people will edit me. Very few people will say, you've got it wrong. And I really want people to say, I've got it wrong if I have. Um, and I'm really grateful when people challenge me because these days, at this point in my life, it's a pretty rare thing. I get lots of people saying, your work's amazing, you've really helped me. Um, you know, I had someone the other day just absolutely delighted with what I did and the impact it had had on their life. And that's lovely and that's very affirming and it's very good for your self-esteem. But if you've got the wrong opinions and somebody, or you've got unhelpful, I should say, because most opinions aren't right or wrong, they're just more or less helpful. Um, if you're thinking unhelpful stuff and nobody tells you that's a problem. So I really value my friends, um, my close friends, because they will tell me if I'm, if I'm going off beam. Um, but most <laughs> of my shifts in thinking have been over years rather than over days. I did have somebody, um, and we both kind of disagreed with each other, but we were really respectful about it, someone on my Facebook. And eventually we sort of, I came to her manner of thinking and she came to my manner of thinking. It was really nice. It was this convergence in the middle, which was really lovely. And that was around perspectives on mental health and autism. So um, I really appreciate those things. I, I do feel sometimes that no one's going to challenge me on things, which... Um, of course, I don't want to be trolled, but I'm quite happy to be challenged. A bit of robust discussion is really useful. So I think if you know anyone who's, um, who's got a profile, then, you know, and you feel the need to challenge them, do so. You do them a favour. Well, it's a sign of respect if you do it respectfully. <laughs> And where it's like an invitation to consider a different perspective as opposed to you're wrong, I'm right. I do get those as well. Um, and I get people, I do a different meme every day. I've been doing that for five years. I've got thousands of things. And um, sometimes someone will just absolutely shoot me down in flames for no good reason. And, and you just think, nah, I'm not engaging in that. You know, it does exist. I think social media is pretty well known for people offering their opinions uh, forthright manner and not very helpfully. Oh, yeah, I would say so. <laughs> it's called being a jerk. <laughs> yes, it's, 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 it's being called sitting in front of a screen and assuming that the screen is what you're being mean to, not the person on the other screen behind it. <laughs> Yen, if people want to read more about your work, where can we send them? I have a website, which is www.yenperkis.com. So yenperkis.com is my website and it has a whole bunch of my good things, including my books. And I've actually just signed a contract for a new book and I've just been offered a contract for another new book so there will be eight what? books this time next year it's really cool isn't it i have to stop this stuff you're unstoppable that's amazing congratulations that's wonderful and i will put a link to all of yen's good stuff at the podcast zoerouth.com slash podcast slash yen y-e-n-n yen thank you so much oh thank you for having me it's been great